Hi everyone, imagine an AI that doesn't just mimic a human brain, but actually replicates its internal workings. Current AI algorithms, like deep learning, only approximate their biological counterparts. Researchers are now pioneering neuromorphic computers, crafting machines that replicate physical characteristics of human brains. What could this mean for the future of AI and the quest for artificial general intelligence? Keep watching to learn more. This video has four, oh, sorry. This video has three parts. What is neuromorphic computing, brain scale neuromorphic computing, and impact on AGI development? Part one, what is neuromorphic computing? Well, in terms of a definition, neuro is the same as the neuro in neurology, and it basically means your nervous system, while morphic is from the Greek, and it means having the shape of, or shape. So neuromorphic computing means a computer in the shape of a nervous system. It's a system that copies the physical characteristics and the design principles of biological nervous systems. I say nervous system, but of course we're most interested in brains. But brains are basically just a special part of your nervous system. The neurons that are in your brain are also spread throughout your body. The nerve cells send messages to each other, and that's how you can tell that someone stepped on your toe. Your brain contains neurons and synapses that connect the neurons, the same as the rest of your body, but your brain also has more complicated structures, including non-neuron cells called glia. So what might a neuromorphic system look like? Of course, in machine learning, you already have neural networks that contain neurons and that are inspired by the human brain. We don't really consider ordinary neural networks to be neuromorphic though, probably because they're just really common at this point, but regular neural networks are actually a big abstraction on the real thing. The way the brain works is closer to what's called a spiking neural network, and a spiking neural network basically adds the concept of time. All the neurons essentially gain charge over time, and once they get high enough, once they spike, then they actually trigger. But because there's time involved, the values are basically slowly added through integration over a large number of simulation steps. Contrast that with a regular neural network where there'll be a single clock tick and all of the neurons will essentially advance at the same time. By way of example, it's a bit like the difference between playing a simple game, like a game of checkers, where people just take turns, and then moving to a full video game where there's a simulation of a world going on and lots of different actions could be happening asynchronously at different times. And just like checkers, it's much simpler than a 3D video game. It's much simpler and more efficient to implement typical neural networks on today's computers than spiking neural networks. But spiking neural network implementations do exist. For example, you can check out SNN Torch, which allows you to do experiments with them. Note that a spiking neural network is still an artificial construct that tries to approximate what's happening in a brain because it's still proceeds through simulation steps, whereas the brain is essentially analog operating in reality. There are other neuromorphic systems as well, some that are based on special purpose hardware. For example, the Memristor, which is a pretty unusual electronic component, to my understanding, that acts like a resistor but has some amount of memory in it, so it can be used to model neurons, basically. There are also other neuromorphic systems that involve special hardware, but in this case, built on top of typical hardware components like transistors. And leveraging mainstream tech is always advantageous because it's much easier to scale, but more about that later in the video. Again, although technically a deep neural network could be considered a neuromorphic system. When people use the term, they normally mean something that's closer to the brain's current biology than our typical techniques. I want to note that there's another concept called organoids, which are basically approaching the problem from the other direction. Instead of trying to create an artificial system that copies as closely as we can what's happening in the brain, organoid intelligence is based on using real human cells. Specifically, an organoid is a three-dimensional organ made of tissue that's grown from pluripotent human stem cells, which are the type of cell that can produce any other cell. You basically start with the stem cells, get them to produce brain cells, and have those sort of construct themselves in 3D the way they would inside a human. These neurons can then process inputs in the form of electrical signals, and they can learn over time. Apparently, you can teach organoids to play Pong and do basic math. And there's a ton of ethical questions about all of this, of course. I'll probably talk about that in a different video. But in terms of neuromorphic computing, that's the idea of creating something artificial out of silicon or whatever that models a brain really closely instead of using the actual DNA present in nature to create real cells. Part two, brain scale neuromorphic computing. This probably doesn't come as a surprise, but the human brain is really complicated and a typical brain has 86 billion neurons and those neurons are all connected by a total of 600 trillion synapses. So it's basically a huge graph with 86 billion nodes and 600 trillion edges between those nodes. 
plus a lot of other cells for maintenance and whatnot, like the glia that we mentioned earlier. The next data point is a little old by now, 11 years old to be precise, but in 2013, the fourth most powerful supercomputer in the whole world tried to model one second of 1% of a human brain, and it took 40 minutes to do that. That's 2,400 times slower than real time. That isn't to say that human brains and supercomputers are completely comparable. They're based on completely different architectures, and the supercomputer was having to use something like a spiking neural network to emulate those brain cells, which is very slow. But if you had instead asked that computer to do a physics simulation, it could probably simulate millions of scenarios a second. And likewise, the human brain would have been very good at doing image processing and parallel computation, but probably very bad at arithmetic. A human brain draws about 20 watts, which is 20% of your body's energy consumption, instead of megawatts or gigawatts that a supercomputer would draw. So our technology will continue to improve, but they're really non-comparable in a lot of ways. Also, an interesting tidbit I learned, a human brain contains about 2,500 terabytes of storage. That's an estimate because data in the brain is stored partially by neurons and partially by synapses. But next time you see someone who's extremely good at something and you wonder, how can they do that? Well, because they have a lot of terabytes of space sitting up there. All this is actually a primary motivation for building neuromorphic computers. We can't understand the brain very well if we can't even simulate tiny fractions of it. So various neuromorphic hardware has been created, but this is an exciting time because the first neuromorphic computer at the scale of a whole human brain is about to be built. It's supposed to be completed in April 2024 at Western Sydney University. Its name, Deep South which is apparently a play on the names of two other systems called True North and Deep Blue, both from IBM, of course. And really, what else are you gonna call your supercomputer when you're in the land down under? This computer, or supercomputer, really, will be able to emulate 228 trillion synaptic operations per second. I don't know how close to real time that is, but remember that a human brain contains only about 600 trillion synaptic connections. The design of this supercomputer is very interesting. First, it's modular, so new capacity can be added as needed. So if tomorrow you want to simulate one and a half human brains, then you just have to buy a little more hardware. And importantly, that hardware is actually built on commercially available platforms. Specifically, it's built on FPGAs, or Field Programmable Gate Arrays. FPGAs are basically a big circuit board with a ton of digital components inside it, which can all be configured in software. So you can decide, today I want this chip to look like this, and then define what all the connections and the components are gonna be, tell that to the FPGA, and suddenly it will now be behaving like that electronic circuit. It's a little bit like firmware, right? It can actually be changed on demand by a computer. And that's really important because you can just buy a bunch of FPGAs and configure them to be precisely how you want. FPGAs only support certain operations, so the researchers almost certainly had to very carefully restrict themselves to components that would be available on FPGAs. But by doing that, they made this supercomputer much easier to construct. It's extremely smart to use mainstream hardware whenever you can, because you can buy it off the shelf, the development cycle is much shorter, and you can benefit from existing factories and existing production techniques. If you're into hardware or simply Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining, you might have heard a couple of terms related to this. FPGAs are the first place that people go when they're trying to experiment with a new design or something because you can easily tweak it. You can easily program it to behave differently. But FPGAs can only hold so many gates, so much electronic circuitry, and they're quite slow, relatively speaking. Once you've prototyped something on an FPGA, if you want it to run really fast, you can actually go to a chip fab and say, hey, this design, the one that I tested on the FPGA, I would like you to make it in hard-coded chips, actual hardware, so to speak. And your design better be right at that point, because if you made a mistake, you'll be out a lot of money. This technology is called ASICs. And if you want to produce some ASIC chips, then the chip fab, the factory, will usually require several million dollars of initial investment. But then each additional chip that you want to make might cost like five cents. So you definitely only do that after testing your design first on an FPGA. But this this is why this neuromorphic computer is so interesting because assuming it works well on those FPGAs, then first of all, other universities can also just buy their own FPGAs and start doing experiments. And additionally, maybe they could pool their
their money together and get a bunch of these chips produced as ASICs, which would probably run a thousand times faster than the original FPGA design. In case you're wondering what is actually implemented on those FPGAs, apparently they're trying to emulate what in the brain is called a mini column. Apparently a mini column is a vertical group of about a hundred different neurons that extends through all the layers of the cortex. They play a key role in information processing and transmission between layers in a human brain. So the designers would have taken that hundred neuron logical structure and implemented it as a single unit on the FPGA. If you think about what computing or data paradigm would be going on there, it's pretty interesting because when you have neurons, then basically data, code, and algorithms are all kind of mixed together and implemented partially with the memory state inside the neuron and partially through which synapses are present, which other neurons it's connected to, and a whole lot of other complicated chemistry besides. Apparently you have to understand all the hormones and chemicals that are going on to really understand the brain. But this approximation in the neuromorphic supercomputer is still digital because an FPGA can only model digital things. You can use that digital system to approximate an analog function if you like and that is essentially what would be going on here. So even though we talk about this fancy new thing called a neuromorphic computer, it's actually a close cousin to the classical computers that we have today. It's still based on today's FPGA, ASIC, and integrated circuit technologies. I want to draw a quick comparison to quantum computing. Quantum computing is much more futuristic. It's trying to leverage physical properties of particles to explore multiple paths at once. The same way that light is both a particle and a wave in the dual slit experiment from physics. And matter only really exhibits quantum effects at the very, very tiny scale, which is the main reason it's very difficult to build a quantum computer. I made a separate video about quantum computers, which I'll link to at the end of this video. Part three, impact on AGI development. What impact will neuromorphic computers have on the development of AGI, or artificial general intelligence? Well, first of all, it depends on which technologies and techniques are actually needed to reach AGI. If large language models are sufficient to reach that high level of intelligence, then there will be no need for new architectures. We can reach AGI by simply scaling out the existing techniques we're using. But if large language models stall out or have difficulty representing certain concepts from a brain, then neuromorphic research will be really important to identify new breakthroughs. I mentioned the energy consumption difference between a human brain and a supercomputer that's trying to emulate a human brain previously. If we continue to use large language models and rely on GPUs to execute those models, then the power consumption of AI is going to grow exponentially because the number of uses will also be growing. I found a stat that by 2027, based on current trends, NVIDIA would sell 1.5 million servers. These are servers with eight GPUs in them, either A100 or H100 or whatever. And yes, you can get GPUs on their own and build your own servers out of it. So this is only an approximation. But anyway, by 2027, that would mean that AI servers are using about 0.5% of the world's total energy consumption, which is about the same amount of electricity that Argentina or Sweden use. Today, data centers consume between 1% and 1.3% of the total energy in the world. So an extra extra 0.5% isn't totally outlandish, but still represents a significant power cost and significant profit for NVIDIA as well, since each of those servers sells for between 200,000 and 480,000 US dollars. But anyway, that's what the future might look like if we continue to rely on GPUs to do model inference. Let's talk about GPUs in comparison with neuromorphic computers. GPUs are extremely parallel computing devices that support a wide range of mathematical functions. For AI, you're generally doing lots of matrix operations and tensor operations. So addition and subtraction in various combinations, I think. Interestingly, we already don't need to use precise computations. In fact, for most AI, work, people use half precision floating point numbers. And for context, computers started out with full precision floating point numbers, and then they quickly used double precision floating point numbers, which are still used today for many or most CPU floating point operations. But when you're doing AI training, you can go back down to half precision. And if you think about it, a GPU is actually analogous to an FPGA because you can tell the GPU what mathematical operation you're going to do. It doesn't know in advance. The same way that you can program an FPGA to do this type of gate layout. 
So if you know what matrix operations are going to be performed for the GPU, then you can actually hard code them. This is analogous to experimenting on the FPGA, finding something that works, and then making an ASIC out of it. Again, you could do that with today's GPUs if you knew exactly what neural network and associated mathematical operations needed to be carried out. The performance gain wouldn't be nearly as dramatic because GPUs are already heavily optimized, but it would use less silicon and it would be cheaper. So maybe that's something Something that will happen at some point. To me, the most interesting consequence of neuromorphic computers, and especially this one that's built on commodity FPGAs, is just that, the fact that it's built on commodity hardware. Take this as an example. We always imagine that as AI starts to develop towards super intelligence, that AI will eventually start optimizing itself. It can optimize its training data, the algorithms that are used, and even the hardware that it's running on. And it's fascinating to think that if it followed in the steps of this neuromorphic supercomputer, Computer, it could actually create a very, very different computing platform upon our existing technologies. That could result in much faster iteration of new technologies and new chips once AI starts to get involved in redesigning hardware. You don't have to wait for the AI to build a quantum computer factory or something like that. And so, since AI is going to start requiring more and more compute, more than any other problem we've ever solved, I think it's highly likely that these types of very different architectures that are still built on our technological base, but that are inspired by biology or have hard-coded pathways or otherwise become very special purpose machines, I think that's gonna become much more prevalent. The future is fast, especially if large language models keep up their pace of becoming 10 times larger every year. Finally, in conclusion, a neuromorphic computer is simply one that is inspired by biology, modeled after the physical structures of the human brain, for example. And while you could consider neural networks and lots of existing technology to be neuromorphic because they are based on nature, people usually use the term to mean something that is much closer to the brain than what we are currently doing. There are existing neuromorphic simulations and physical hardware, but they're all much smaller than the capacity of a single human brain. And the first neuromorphic computer that is at the scale of a human brain, which is called Deep South, will come online in April of 2024, just a few months away Way as of the filming of this video. This particular platform is based on FPGAs, which are mainstream hardware. And that is really important because it means that this new computing architecture can really benefit from all of the existing scale of chip fabs around the world. When it comes to accelerating the development of AGI, that depends on how effective large language models on their own are. If large language models kind of stall out or they end up having trouble representing something that's important for a brain, then the neuromorphic research will end up being essential. But will it turn AGI in two years into AGI in one year? I don't know, but it's more like if we actually need additional breakthroughs beyond just transformers and scale, then this is a really promising avenue so it's good that research is being done. And the way that this research is being done on commodity hardware is exciting because an AGI or any AI model that's not quite there yet could optimize its own hardware in a similar fashion, producing entirely new architectures that can still be manufactured in today's current chip fabs. So if our slow and power hungry GPU implementations of learning systems end up to be non-optimal, then perhaps we'll be able to switch to a new paradigm quickly. If you liked this video, check out this previous one I made where I talk in detail about quantum computing. The world is a wild place at the quantum level. I also made a really detailed video about GPUs and how they work and how they power AI. So you can check out that one over here if you're interested. What do you know? Two recommendations. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.